Okay. Um, I'm not really going to talk uh, a lot about the mechanics of uh, whole genome sequencing. Um, I'm going to describe how the Partner Center for Personalized Genetic Medicine is organized, describe the Laboratory for Molecular Medicine, which is our CLIA certified lab, uh, talk a little bit about our plans to, uh, to launch this service, uh, which is very much along the lines of uh, what Howard and David are doing at MCW. Uh, and, and focus in on Gene Insight uh, Lab and Clinic as a critical piece of software and something that may be shareable with uh, uh, other members of the group. So <clears throat> how is PCPGM uh, organized? We, uh, we, we have a set of research cores, uh, which are the sort of the standard uh, uh, cores that are also used by our CLIA certified lab. And these uh, uh, research cores both support research and support the clinical lab, and they are CLIA certified. Um, we're supporting about $140 million of research across Partners Healthcare. Just for those of you that don't know, Partners Healthcare is uh, uh, the umbrella organization for Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and uh, involves a number of ancillary uh, uh, facilities that are linked to those two academic medical centers. So <clears throat> th this, is th uh, uh, this, this is all clear. We also have a very active uh, uh, RPDR and electronic medical record that's used for research. Uh, um, Sean Murphy actually runs this. It's, it's not actually technically part of the center. Most of the research that's being done here is not genetic. Uh, there are about 3,000 projects that are going on and over 4 million uh, uh, partners' patients that are being used for research using the electronic medical record. And, and this is the piece that's not yet built. Uh, we've just actually gotten approval uh, uh, to go forward with uh, um, the Partners uh, Biorepository for Medical Discovery, uh, <clears throat> which is going to be a, um, a, a biorepository which will be linked uh, uh, to both the CLIA lab and to the electronic medical record. And our goal is to have the biorepository actually CLIA certified as well, because going forward, this, this, we're, we're doing this as a, in a consented fashion, and I think the reasons for that uh, um, uh, are manyfold, but I, I think the most important is is that we want to be able to uh, um, do research on these patients, but also be able to push things forward in terms of clinical research uh, 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 and clinical care, and, and it's going to be a lot easier to do that if this is uh, uh, um, both CLIA approved and if the patients are consented. So that's uh, how the center is organized. So between the investigators that we're supporting here uh, currently, there is a, 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 um, a service, Crimson, which is now, I just became operative at Mass General, uh, has been operative at the Brigham for the last three years, and that's supporting about $40 million in research. So between uh, $140 or so million dollars worth of research that's using the EMR, another $150 that's using these cores, and the $40 here, we're supporting about $300 million of research for uh, uh, approximately uh, um, 400, 500 uh, partners, investigators across uh, uh, the healthcare system, <clears throat> and, and I think. Sorry, I, I think it's, oh. Do I go back? Um, perhaps the most important part is the IT infrastructure that that, that supports all of this, because uh, w without this IT infrastructure. Uh, we wouldn't be able to have uh, uh, samples flowing seamlessly from the CLIA lab to the research cores, to the biorepository, to other investigators, samples going to the Broad or wherever. So uh, the IT infrastructure here is clearly the major investment uh, uh, in terms of the center and the way it works. So a little bit about the Laboratory for Molecular Medicine. Heidi Rehm, uh, who was at the previous uh, NHGRI workshop with Robert Green uh, um, uh, last week, is the director of the lab. Uh, um, this lab has been in existence uh, since 2003, and we do about 4,000 genetic tests a year. Uh, we do these tests for both uh, the two partners' hospitals, uh, but also uh, for uh, medical institutions uh, around the country and uh, uh, in some cases around the world. Uh, the bulk of our testing is in cancer and cardiovascular disease. We do have some other uh, um, oligogenic and monogenic traits that we, uh, we test for. Uh, um, and uh, currently, we're, uh, uh, we have tests for uh, over 200 genes. The challenge here, obviously, and this is an example of one of our first tests, both are two uh, uh, academic uh, cancer centers uh, produced uh, papers within 
a few months of each other looking at EGFR as a gene for uh, um, a treatment response for small cell lung cancer, and within three months, uh, the lab had a test up and running uh, uh, to test patients, and we still uh, do the bulk of the testing for the Dana-Farber, although uh, the MGH does uh, their own testing now uh, uh, for uh, EGFR. <clears throat> a little bit of context uh, uh, in terms of the evolution of clinical genetic testing, which I think g gives maybe a, a, a further uh, um, justification, if you will, for the approach that Howard outlined earlier. Um, the, the, this, it, you can see along here uh, uh, how the evolution of testing in the lab has, uh, has occurred. And, it, you know, we, we've expanded tests and expanded uh, the number of tests uh, in, in the areas that we've been uh, uh, genotyping, but we're reaching the point now where uh, it costs, it's going to cost as much uh, uh, to genotype uh, the whole genome uh, um, as it will, uh, in fact, the cost of the genotyping will be less than the cost of our cardio chip uh, uh, genotyping. This, the, the cardio chip test, uh, I, I think, costs on the order of $3,000. Uh, it's likely that a whole genome, uh, at least the genomic uh, 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 sequencing portion of that test is going to be well below that in, in a year or so. So we're, we're entering this logarithmic phase where whole genome sequencing is going to be uh, uh, relatively cheap, but the thing that's going to lag behind, as has been pointed out by a number of people already, is the analysis and the ability to build content to uh, uh, deliver to practitioners. That's going to be the major challenge uh, going forward. It's not going to be the sequencing itself. And we, we anticipate that uh, you know, all of our tests now are uh, um, uh, targeted next generation sequencing tests, and we expect to be completely out of that business in two years, uh, simply because uh, it's just not going to be economically viable uh, uh, to do it. So <clears throat> our service is organized uh, uh, si very similar to the way uh, uh, MCW has organized theirs. We're outsourcing uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, actual sequencing to Illumina and uh, uh, complete genomics. Uh, we're going to concentrate all of our efforts on data analysis uh, using the existing infrastructure of the LMM uh, and all of the things that Howard talked about in terms of patient workup, consent, uh, uh, um, uh, oversight, uh, uh, clinical committees is uh, uh, all going to be in place. And we're probably going to launch this, or we're, we would like to launch it, in July of 2012. Um, the major factor in terms of whether we will be able to do that or not is going to depend on our uh, IT infrastructure, I think. I think it's interesting to look at this from the context from the clinician's perspective. Uh, um, the amount of information that's going to be on, uh, generated uh, for clinicians is truly daunting. Uh, and new information can emerge on any of these variants at any time. Um, and <clears throat> new forms of support are already needed to stay up to date on the limited number of variants that we've identified using the tests, uh, the, the uh, uh, clinical support tools that we have now. Uh, and the infrastructure uh, um, it, it, it dependent clinical process need to be established to uh, allow clinicians to retrieve and manage genetic results. Uh, to link clinician uh, uh, to experts uh, capable of determining the implications of each of these uh, 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 um, genomic variants and uh, keep them up to date. And uh, obviously this whole process uh, uh, um, it, it, we've linked to the clinical uh, genetics programs at the two hospitals, Mike Murray who runs clinical genetics at the Brigham and David Sweetser who's his uh, comparable uh, um, person at Mass General are involved with Heidi and uh, Robert Green uh, and, and me as we sort of formulate the plans to uh, launch this service. But this also, I think, creates significant, significant opportunities uh, uh, for Partners Healthcare in particular because of tools that we've already developed and would, would like to share with people here. Um, You've got this constant flow of uh, uh, cases that are going to the geneticists in the lab to sign out these cases. You've got this evolving knowledge base and th the need to continuously update the electronic medical record and report information to clinicians. And <clears throat> we've developed a tool uh, uh, that we call Gene Insight uh, uh, that uh, we use both uh, as a report generating engine, but is used in the laboratory as a knowledge base. 
so we keep uh, uh, information on all of the variants that uh, uh, we've genotyped in the lab, uh, um, and uh, um, we, we obviously use this to report the results to, to the electronic medical record. And both of these, I think, are going to be, turn out to be a, a very important. Heidi Rehm has actually put in a U41 grant to uh, uh, address the issue that people have been talking about here, and uh, which is a huge issue, which is <clears throat> variants, variants linked to clinical phenotype, allele frequencies, uh, 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 allele frequencies in people that don't have the phenotype, uh, um, standard ways of reporting uh, uh, and uh, annotating variants. This is going to be a huge issue going forward, and if this group uh, decides to make that an issue uh, uh, that, that uh, people want to collaborate on, I think that uh, we have several people in uh, our center who would be very interested in participating in that. <clears throat> so th this is what Gene Insight looks like uh, if you're at a terminal uh, um, in, in your office. This is a patient named Curious George who happens to have a cardiomyopathy, and he had a, a variant that was previously classified as uh, of unknown significance that has been now reclassified as pathogenic. Uh, um, so we, c we can update these in real time. We can push this information to the clinicians. Uh, we can provide uh, decision support tools uh, uh, through this software and uh, uh, help to enable the clinicians to manage these patients and to help them uh, seek support from uh, uh, genetics experts if they need uh, uh, that backup and support. So, uh, and, and I think that this software, it, it, although it is clearly at the, the terminal end of the pipeline that Howard described, uh, it's still software that is uh, potentially val valuable and uh, uh, um, we'd be interested in sharing it with others uh, and working with others who might want to use it. No. No, it's not sitting on the research database. And this is just the people who have helped uh, uh, get this center off the ground. Yes, Debbie. So, um, should I wait or can everybody hear me? Really loudly. All right. Uh, Scott. Yes. Tell me what made you change from one category to pathogenic. That's a big change from, uh, you know. For an individual variant? Yeah. So what was the level of evidence that made you make that switch? Yeah, I'm, I'm, probably, not the, I'm probably not the best, you know, I don't, I don't run the clinical lab. That's sort of like the question that uh, uh, Howard deferred to, J, uh, to, to David. I, I think that uh, uh, the, the geneticists in the lab have a whole bunch of criteria that they use uh, uh, to decide whether something a, a variant changes. They look at the literature, they're looking at the, uh, 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 a, 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 a lot of different things, but it, 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 and, and I agree with you that 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 whole issue is one that is uh, 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 well. It's well. It's, I think it's not. A, it's not just a nightmare. It's one where there's not clear standards, and some people might do it one way, and other might, people might do it another too. So that I think it's going to. I mean, people are beginning to look at this because it's. It, uh, can I borrow that for a second? Uh, people are beginning to look at this because it's such an important question, but I do think it is key because what has been reported in the literature, if you go today with modern databases, what in a family segregated and what was uh, without functional studies or even some maybe not appropriate functional study caused uh, uh, or said was causal, well, you not hold up. Yeah, I'm, well, I think that. The, you know, there's clearly variants that were found for monogenic disorders where the variants are in linkage to this equilibrium with a causal variant, and it was reported that that was the causal variant. So I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that this is a huge area. I think it's an area that's going to demand a lot of attention. What I wanted to focus on here was not so much the process that we do that, but the fact that the software allows us to change the interpretation. And I think that's going to be important because I think that going forward, it, 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 it's, this is not something where it's going to be set in stone. Yeah, but it, I think it's important also if you're taking data from a provider, what they're providing, let's say, oh, yeah. in a CLIA setting yeah. is not necessarily the end of the uh, genome. No, no question. And, and a, a CLIA certification doesn't mean that an interpretation is set in stone. 
So you're looking at a lot of places to reduce costs, and you're doing some of the whole genome sequencing then at the clear labs, like Illumina. And when you look at these, at like 4,000 bucks, and they'll do the alignment, call the variants with something that's good enough, um, do you see bringing that, I mean, I, I guess I'm wondering why bring that back if you have to reinvent all the analysis questions and all the, getting the, the initial lab set up. Um, is that a part that you really see needs to be in-house? I think that, you know, we have uh, uh, currently two high seeks that are being used for uh, 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 research sequencing. We're not doing any of the whole, we haven't started doing whole genome sequencing ourselves in the uh, um, uh, 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 research core. Uh, I, I think that um, whether we ultimately bring this in-house or how much we do at, at partners and how much we rely on uh, uh, Illumina and complete genomics is a fluid thing. It's not something that's been set in stone. I, I don't know that we'll, we, the one thing I'm pretty sure we're not going to do is we're not going to build the giant sequencing facility in Waltham to uh, uh, sequence all partners' patients. I don't think that's probably in the cards. But how, how much we actually do ourselves and how much we outsource, I think, is, a, is an open question. I think for us, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of the analysis and the interpretation is what's paramount. But when you say analysis interpretation, I think that was different than I, what was referred to earlier, which is how do you call the variants? Your real concern with analysis then is interpretation. So they're kind of two. No, I think, I think we would include that as well. I, I, and I think that all of the issues that were described are issues that we uh, 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 are, are going to consider in terms of how we do this. It, 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 just, nothing here. Uh, it is uh, uh, set in stone. Per virtually everything about this is a moving target. So uh, how we decide to do this today may be very different from how we decide to do it, uh, you know, six months or a year from now. Um. Scott, you, you may have mentioned it, but can you clarify whether the Gene Insight is designed as a standalone tool, or is it uh, in any way linkable with an EMR? To no, it's, talk it's, to EMR. It's absolutely linkable with, it, with an EMR. You, you, you know, several uh, uh, um, other health systems actually have been using it. Uh, uh, we, we collaborate with Intermountain Health. They're, they're using it. Uh, um, so it, it's definitely linkable with other, other uh, s software and other EMRs. So, so, so I, I had the exact same question, but that means it's a standalone tool because if it's not, if different thing, EMRs can talk to it, it means it's not tied to a specific EMR, is that correct? That's correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's really a service layer, so it reduces the number of interfaces, so you don't have to build interfaces with every single laboratory. Um, you know, that basically this resides between the, the clinical laboratories and the information systems, and so you really build one interface from, an, from a clinical site to uh, Gene Insight, and then you can interact with all the laboratories that use that. And so it just simplifies the interface construction with otherwise, in a distributed single gene, gene by gene type of thing, you have an infinite number of interfaces that you have to build. Now, again, it may become a moot point if we all move into next-gen whole genomes, uh, but at least at this point it was a very pragmatic solution. Actually, it's a follow-up on, on your question. As, as all of these modular components are proposed and developed by different, different people, is there any, any um, idea that in the end something like data.gov and semantic technologies will be somehow the milieu or the middle layer that all these things used to talk to each other? I don't know if anyone has a comment on that? This is, So this is a, um, something that uh, groups are talking about, and specifically since this involves a lot of moving, pushing of data around, uh, the clinical genomics group of uh, HL7 uh, has specifically uh, constituted a, a working group within their uh, working group uh, to look at whole genome and whole exome sequencing and how that data can be characterized. And they have other working groups that have looked at other types of data models within this arena for family history. Uh, and there are additional working groups that are outside of the genomic working group that do clinical um, uh, decision support uh, models, but essentially all building on a common um, uh, standard language so that the, uh, there's relatively seamless 
uh, movement of the information that you want as long as the information system is built using that type of a communication standard, in this case an HL7 version 2.x.